Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'd like to welcome Adam Chipala to uh, MSR. Adam's a, uh, a postdoc at Harvard, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, his language, Ur-Web, which is about uh, metaprogramming Ajax apps with static types. Thanks. So I'm going to be talking about a new programming language that makes it easier to build correct web applications. And I want to start by reviewing what the main challenges are in, in building web applications today. In the beginning of the web, things were, were pretty simple. All it was was clients asking web servers to give them particular static pages. And the, when you're building a website, the model you might have in mind is that your website is a, a big graph with interconnections between your, your different pages. But unfortunately, the actual implementation of the website is a bunch of HTML pages that encode links between pages using URLs as text. So it's possible to make a mistake in the URL or remove a page that's still being referenced from a URL somewhere. And it's hard to have an idea of how a change to your application is going to affect the, the overall structure and whether you'll, you'll make it invalid somehow. So already there, there's an opportunity for, for using some higher level language structure to make it easier to build the correct applications. Then we came, come to the use of CGI scripts, which is a, a way for a request from a client to be serviced by having the web server spawn some external process, tell it what the client request says, and have that process decide which page should be returned to the client. And now things get even harder because there's that same idea of you have a big web of pages that you need to keep consistent, but now it's sort of an infinite graph because you can have different pages based on different inputs that the client might provide to your application. And that can take the form of, for instance, a forum website where users can come and post messages that everyone else can see. And maybe the, there's a mischievous user who says that the, the body of his message can, contains some HTML. And maybe you didn't implement your application defensively enough. And this HTML just gets transplanted directly into the, the page output that you showed up to other users visiting your website. And maybe this has some unintended side effect. And that could include things like including JavaScript code in that HTML, which essentially would let users cause your website to tell other users' web browsers to run arbitrary code. And this is what's called a code injection attack, where some insufficiently uh, filtered input from the user is treated directly as a program to be evaluated. So it would be nice to have ways of being sure that your program doesn't have this kind of vulnerability in it. And it's also common for web applications to use relational databases as persistent backends where they, they store their data. And for this to work, your application has to have in mind a view of what actually the database is, including which tables there are and which columns they have. And the database has its own version of that information. And if these two get out of sync, then you can run into some trouble, including some potential security violations. And this is what's ended up being called the impedance mismatch problem in interfacing systems like this. And the way that this kind of interface has traditionally been implemented is just that the, your application constructs queries and commands as strings and just sends those over to the database, which interprets them as programs. And if you don't take sufficient care in constructing these strings, there are other possibilities for attacks where maybe the, the user comes up with a clever string to enter in one of your forms. and because you're taking his input and including it in your SQL query, but you forgot to, say, escape the string properly, then the user finds a way to be able to run arbitrary SQL commands as your web application. And this can have bad consequences for the integrity of your data. So things get even more complicated when we move into what's called Web 2.0 today, which is a, a movement to have more of the structure of an application run inside the the client web browser using JavaScript so that there's not so much of uh, every action causes a page refresh and takes a long time to reload the entire page. So what might happen is that things start out as in the, in the old way, where a, a page is returned to 
the client, and it might contain some JavaScript code that every once in a while decides it wants to make a remote procedure call to the server to ask it to change something or, or query some information. So this call is traditionally implemented with a serialization format like XML, and the web server comes up with a response to your query. And the client then needs to use that information to perform some imperative modifications to the in-memory representation of the, the tree structure of the page that's being displayed. So this whole loop of making asynchronous queries and then updating the structure of the page without reloading the whole page is what's ended up being called the AJAX application style. You might want to go even further and for applications like a mail client, you might want to let it be the, the server that initiates some kind of communication asynchronously. Maybe the server wants to tell the client that some new piece of mail is available to be displayed. But unfortunately, with the internet today, you can't really directly implement this connection from the server to the client because a lot of clients are behind firewalls that will disallow that kind of connection. So in practice, you need to have some convoluted, inverted way of implementing this where the client makes a, an HTTP request that is usually referred to as long polling, which says, uh, let me know when the next event happens. And both the client and the server are expecting that this connection might sit idle for a long time before anything interesting actually happens. And when something does happen, the server can just return a response, uh, just like in the AJAX case. And then the client is responsible for reinitiating this connection. And the, implementing that manually can be complicated enough, but maybe your application is actually dynamically generating some JavaScript code that's dependent on the client request. And that just makes getting this right even harder. So these examples show a bunch of different ways that it's possible to make a mistake in crafting a web application. There are a, there's this common pattern of taking the easy way out and, and implementing some kinds of interaction by interpreting strings as code at runtime, including for HTML, SQL, JavaScript, or the formats like XML that are used for these RPC messages. And whenever you're interpreting strings as code, there's always a chance for something unexpected to make its way into the interpreter. And there are a bunch of different protocols and conventions for manipulating the structure of a document and using different styles of communication between the client and the server where it's easy to make mistakes that have security consequences or just make it harder to get your program to a working state. There have been a bunch of solutions proposed recently that try to give you complete toolkits for, for building web applications. Uh, Ruby on Rails and Django are two of the most popular ones, which are based on some of the most common dynamic scripting languages. They provide libraries that encapsulate some of the details of this functionality. Uh, but these are dynamically typed languages, and there's still a lot of interpreting strings as code in pretty ad hoc ways. So even if you test your application thoroughly, it's hard to know that it really respects all the abstractions that you'd like it to. To help get around that problem, there have been a bunch of recent proposals of languages that use static type systems to rule out some of the potential problems. And Lynx and Oxygen are two examples of, in this category. These are languages inspired by functional programming in the tradition of Haskell and ML that use type systems and more explicit formal representations to rule out some of these problems. And there's also the, the Lynx system, which handles, uh, among other things, the impedance mismatch problem for communicating with the database. But I think there are a few areas that are mostly neglected in, in this kind of research. And one of them is figuring out what are the right abstraction and modularity techniques for structuring a web application to make it easy to read the code and convince yourself that it has certain properties, much in the same way that we have come to encapsulate definitions of abstract data types inside of classes or, or modules so that we can read just a small amount of code and know something very definite about how that data structure behaves. For instance, you might want to take the total structure of your website and chop off a little chunk of it and be able to be sure that the rest of the application only interacts with that part of it that you chopped off in very well-defined ways. Maybe any links that go into it go through a particular formally defined interface in the form of a, of a type signature. And so you can sort of formally or informally prove theorems to yourself about what this part of your application could actually do in practice. You also might want to identify some 
chunks of your database that should be thought of as belonging to particular modules. And you'd like to know that no one ever touches those parts of the database except by going through a particular well-defined code interface that has a, a static type signature. And this lets you be able to enforce invariance about the contents of the database in much the same way that we're used to doing for abstract data types in traditional programming. And it's also useful to think about the, the dynamic structure of a, a web page in the client and wanting to be able to designate a, a subtree of that page that you can think of as belonging to a particular module of the application. And you'd like to know that none of the other pieces of your application can directly change that part of the page, but rather they'd have to go through a, a statically enforced interface to do so. So the language that I'm going to be telling you about, Urweb, uh, is based on ideas from ML and Haskell, and it imports a, a bunch of the common abstraction and modularity features from those languages. And the, the big one for enabling this kind of modular reasoning is the, the ideas from the ML module system, which can be used for uh, idioms like placing a database inside a module or placing a bunch of pages syntactically inside a module and using interfaces to control all the ways that they can be accessed from the outside. And the other main uh, way that frameworks like Ruby on Rails and, and Django make life easier for the for programmers has been largely ignored in systems based on static types, and that's metaprogramming. One of the most popular features of Rails is something called scaffolding, where let's say that you have a new application that's based around a particular database table. And you want to get started right away building your application once you decide what the table looks like. So you call a command line code generator application, and you pass it a short description of what each of the columns in your table is and what its type is. And that generator builds a standard directory structure for your initial application that has among it some, some files of Ruby source code. And you can start using this right away. And it gives you a standard interface for things like listing the contents of your table and adding new rows and updating or deleting rows. And this turns out to be really popular and, and useful among uh, mainstream web programming. But you can probably see this has some of the, the usual disadvantages of ad hoc code generation. Let's say that there's a new version published of the code generator that adds some, some features that you'd like to have in your application. But you took the output of the old generator and you just started hacking on it and adding your own new customizations. And so that gives you no real easy way to merge in the, the changes from the, from the new code generator with your custom changes that you implemented in the source file. And it's also really hard to implement one of these generators correctly if it all it's doing is manipulating source code strings in an unprincipled way without much static checking. So here's what we'd really like, or at least what I'd really like. It's the sort of the same basic picture, except the thing that comes out in the end isn't just a directory structure with some text. It's a first class value in your programming language that stands for a piece of the application. And this might be a function or a module in the ML and Haskell kind of view of the world. And this thing that comes out should have a static type that guarantees that it's free of certain kinds of abstraction violations, like code injection attacks or uh, dangling links and so on. Even better, we'd like the code generator to have a static type that guarantees that no matter which input you give it, if that input is well typed, then the thing that comes out is guaranteed to be free of any of this kind of, of application flaw. And since I'm used to functional programming, I'd, I'd like to go even further and be able to do, write a higher order code generator that is parameterized on another piece of code that you might think of as a generator, uh, maybe encapsulating some common pattern that's still specific to a particular application. And this should all work pretty naturally. So uh, to make it possible to write this kind of program with static types, I've drawn on some features that are mostly associated with dependently typed programming languages like Calk and Agda. Uh, but from my perspective, it's not the dependent types feature that's so important where a type can contain a runtime value in it, but it's more the idea of type level computation where a type can be a program that computes a, a rich functional relationship between the properties of an input to a function and the properties that should hold to the output. And I'll be able to give you some more examples of, of what that means in this context and why it's useful a little later. So my proposed solution is based on a, a new language, which is more or less a, dependent, more or less a general purpose language, 
though I haven't used it for anything beyond web applications so far. It's called Ur. It has some abstraction modularity features that are useful in a bunch of different domains. But on top of that, I add a, a library with a support for some web-specific things. There's a, an encoding of HTML, such as static types, can validate the structure of your documents, and you can embed fragments of Ur code in documents for things like the event handler on a button for code that should fire if the button gets clicked. There's support for client-side AJAX-style programming without any explicit JavaScript or XML, and support for the other server push model of, of programming without any XML or without any explicit polling of the kind that I described that must happen under the hood. And there's also a sort of orthogonal interface to an SQL database that uses static types to ensure that the uh, communication is done properly. And all of this you can think of as a, a special standard library for Ur that's, that turns it into a domain-specific language for web programming. And the, the implementation of the, the compiler for this language works by starting out with a parser that's specific to the, the web language that understands some notations like HTML literal syntax and the syntax of SQL queries. And that's passed off to a type inference engine that's completely generic in, it only deals with the, the Ur language, and all these other features are encoded in terms of a, an expressive type system. And then there are optimization and code generation phases that are specific to this, this web version of the language. And in the end, the different parts of the code end up being run on the server side or the client side, and with the first kind, their output is native code, and the second kind, they end up as JavaScript that's embedded in pages that the, the server side piece returns to clients. So uh, let me give you an overview of the features of that, that gen general language, Ur, that make it possible to encode these libraries effectively. The, the main uh, novel features are related to type-level computation. And one of the biggest of those features is a support for type-level records. So here's an example of a type-level record. It looks sort of like. Uh, ML list syntax with, with names attached to each element of a list. This is a, a record that you can think of as a mapping from names to types, and the name A is mapped to the type int, and the name B is mapped to the type float. So it's fairly uh, standard looking, but we might also think about having a record of functions over types. So this is where the type level computation really comes in. We might have a record that says the, the name C as the value of a function that maps a type T to itself. And name D has the value of a function that maps a type T to a pair type, where the, both the first and second components of the pair are T. And we can also have records of other data structures built up from types, including pairs of types. And all these different patterns end up being useful in developing and describing web applications. Is there a distinction between the star notation for tuples and the common notation? Um, so the star notation is a description of other values. Like the, the star type describes uh, runtime values, whereas the comma is used for giving that the, there's an overlap between a compile time layer that where some things describe the runtime layer, but some things are just data on their own. And the star is for describing the runtime layer, and the comma is for describing standalone pieces of data that are only used at compile time. I don't know if that explained it well enough, but <laughs> it's, 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 this is basically like system F omega, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and the star is for building something of kind type, and the comma is for building something of kind record. I don't know. That does it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And one of the probably the most obvious thing to do with one of these type level records is use it to build a type that describes a record that actually exists at runtime. And we can do that with the dollar sign operator, which takes a record of types and changes it or uh, injects it into the set of types. And one of these types is standing for runtime records, where the type of each field is described by whatever that field got mapped to in the record that you passed to the dollar sign. Yeah? Is your income a string in an anonymous record? Uh, 
it's that's a a tuple which is different from a record because you you know ahead of time what all the fields are, whereas the record can vary. <laughs> So the, the usual ML syntax for a record type is really just a shorthand for, in the case of this example on the bottom line, taking the record on the top line and applying the dollar sign operator to it to inject it into, to translate it from a record of types into a type. And we can concatenate records uh, in, in our, inside our types. And we might think about writing a concatenation like this one that wants to combine two records that both map the name A to types, but they disagree in which type that is. And it turns out that to make type inference work well, it's convenient to rule out concatenations like this one. So the type system is going to enforce that you can't concatenate two records that share any field names. So that one's not legal. And another important ingredient in the, the kind of encodings that I'll be showing you is a type level map function, which works just like map in usual functional programming, except it's, it's running only at compile time, sort of like the crazy things that happen in C++ templates, but in a, in a more principled kind of way. So here's an example use of map that you might apply to the first record in the, the first line of this slide. If you have a record of types, you might apply a function that transforms it by walking through and changing every type to a function type that uses the original type as both the domain and the range. You can also think about mapping over the second example in the second line of this slide where you have a record of type functions and you can step through each of these and replace each of, them, each of those functions with what you get when you call that function on the type int. So if we, if we apply this function to the, that second line of this slide, we get a record that maps C to uh, int and maps D to int star int. Yeah? Can you explain this map line again? Uh, Okay, so, so uh, what is R one? R one is a record. Yeah, so I'm I'm thinking of R one is some record that's that's like this, the example on the top line of the slide, okay. that that is an association of names with types, mm -hmm. and so we're going to step through the record, and for each one of those types, we're going to replace it what we with what we get when we apply this function, to the type. Oh, so this is just like a something that you apply on the syntax itself. It's yeah. got nothing to do with like runtime computation. Right. Everything on this slide is a separate compile time only language that's only there for describing typing constraints. And this is, this is standard in uh, programming with dependent types, but uh, the difference here is that I'm, I'm trying to make it a little easier to use this for real programming. All right. So we could also apply, we can also do a map over that third line in the record constant examples where we have pairs of types and we can step over each of those and pull out the two pieces of the pair and use them to form a new function type. Uh, all right. So now we can move on to the actual runtime part of the language which is closer to uh, what functional programmers are usually familiar with. We can write record constants in the, the same old ML style way. Their, their types are implemented using this more general machinery, but you can more or less ignore that if you don't need to use that stuff directly. You can project out fields in the, the standard way. And we can also concatenate together to runtime records with analogous syntax to that from the previous slide. Uh, we can cut out fields of records to form a record with all the fields except that one. We might also want to concatenate two records that share a field name in a similar way to on the previous slide, but for the same reason, I'm going to rule out concatenations that, that reuse field names because it makes type inference trickier, so that one's no good. Uh, we might want to write a function that abstracts over the idea of taking a record and adding the mapping a equals zero to it. So here is a way of expressing that using polymorphism. Uh, we have a uh, function that binds a type variable, fs, and we write uh, formal arguments that are type variables inside the square brackets. We bind the type variable fs that stands for a set of fields and the types that they're mapped to, also called a row type a lot of the times in uh, programming language theory. And we say that the, 
there's no, a value level argument R that is a record whose fields are described by that type variable that we abstracted over. So if, if fs is empty, then R is an empty record. And if fs says A says B equals float, then R is a record containing one field of type B of type float. Sorry, one field with name B that has a value of type float. And then we can just take R and concatenate this new binding A equals zero onto it. Yes? Is the dollar sign an operator here like on FS, or is that a different name variable? Oh, it, it's an operator. It's the operator that injects a record of types into the set of types. So the problem, there's a problem with this definition, which is that there's no, yes? So in usual, this ML, ML-like notation, it provides something like this. You have a polymorphic uh, type argument, and then you can just use the type argument in the place of a regular type. But here you put a dollar before the type. Right. So Why are you doing that? Because FS isn't a type. It's a record of types. And you can ah. turn a record of types into a type by saying, build the type that figures out its fields by consulting this record. It's a record of types. OK. Uh, should I say more about that? Or? Okay. So a uh, problem with this definition is that there's nothing here to force FS not to already include a mapping for A. And, and I said that we don't want to allow uh, clashes for field names. So this definition can't actually be accepted directly. Instead, we can give this alternate definition, which is like the previous line, but I add an explicit constraint, uh, this piece here, which gives essentially two different records and asserts that they must not share any field names. So this constraint is saying that A should not be among the fields that are used in FS. And with that, the, the type checker is able to verify that this concatenation doesn't induce any conflicts on record field names. Framework developers using this or web application developers using this? Uh, I envision web application developers calling functions that have these types and not really knowing what's happening but being glad that it works. <laughs> so this function can be assigned a, a static type. And it's a type that says for all fs, which are records of types, is indicated by taking type and putting curly braces around it. Uh, when this constraint is satisfied, then you can have a function of this type, which sort of, uh, once you get used to the notation, expresses that you're starting out with a record that has fields fs, and then you end up with a record that has more fields, where you, in particular, you added the mapping a equals int onto that record. There's another useful feature that works well in conjunction with this kind of thing, with it, which is first class names. Here's a function that is polymorphic over the name of a record field. That's this argument, nm, here. So it's a function that works for any name, as long as the constraint is satisfied that that name is not equal to a. And if that's true, let's build a, a two-field record that takes the name you asked for and assigns that to value 0 and assigns a to value 1.0. Uh, it's type inference because it's used as a name here. There's a, there's a more explicit syntax if you want to make it clearer for the reader. You can also have uh, records of records of types. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all this is uh, generalizes the recursive a recursive grammar of, of types of types, otherwise known as kinds. And this function has a type which says for all names nm, when you know that nm is not equal to a, then you can produce a record of this kind, which is a normal type, except instead of a, a known field, we see the, the name variable nm appearing. We, we can also write a function that is polymorphic and implements the usual record projection operator and makes that a first class function. Uh, we can do that by saying this is parameterized over three different type parameters, a field name, the type of that field, and the names and types of all the other fields. We need to know that this name does not overlap with any of those fields. And if so, we can take in a record whose fields are everything in this list that we passed in, plus a mapping from the field we asked for to the type we asked for. And if that's true, then 
by looking at this, it's, it's syntactically apparent that the field NM belongs to R, so we can just project that field out of R. By the way, we are still trying to define functions that mess over the syntax, right? Are we defining functions that do computation at runtime? Uh, this slide is, is runtime computations. Okay. Sorry, I think of expressions as saying that, but I realize that's not a universal convention. <laughs> So the type of this function, it says here are these three type variables uh, that where the first one's a name, the second one's a type, the last one's a record of types. Uh, we have this same disjointness constraint like before, and then a type that, that expresses that we're, we're looking inside this record, seeing what is associated with name, and that type is what the function returns. And it's pretty easy to call a function like this. Uh, it turns out that from the, the form of it, we can usually deduce by inference what the values of t and fs are. But the, the value of nm should be specified explicitly. Otherwise, we might project out the wrong field that just happens to have the type we were looking for. So we can write an explicit type level argument uh, inside brackets. So here we pass uh, pound b, which is the first class value standing for the name b. And we can pass a, a record as the additional argument, and type inference figures out the rest of the details and automatically figures out which constraints need to be proved and proves them for us. So the FS really is like a, a row variable, right? Row polymorphism uh, that you might find in, say, uh, uh, versions of Haskell as well. Uh, so I'm more familiar with the object system of OCaml, for example. I'm not sure what Haskell provides. I'm definitely not surprised if they have something like this in DHC. And so it seems like the additional thing you're providing here is uh, first class record names. The name itself you can quantify over. Right. Uh, it's the record names and. Uh, record field names. Yeah. Field names and the ability to write maps over records at the type level. Uh, and these disjointness constraints you can maybe think of as just necessary for supporting those features or is something separate. But those are the main the syntactic differences that you see compared to OCaml. All right, so I know this is sort of abstract, so now I can actually show you a demo in, in a web browser uh, that hopefully expresses why these are useful features to have. Obviously, I have to start out with the Hello World application. Uh, this is... Uh, application that just acts like a static page. And here's the source file for it. Uh, this is demonstrating the, the, the basic features of, of UrWeb that handle the structure web applications explicitly so that the type system can make sure you don't mess that up. This is just an ML style function definition that returns a, a piece of XML syntax included inline in the page. And this syntax is, is parsed and type checked to make sure that you don't use tags in the wrong places or that it, you don't use a tag with a wrong attribute name or other properties like that. We can build an application with a link, which doesn't sound that exciting, but at least uh, the, the compiler is using type checking to make sure that there are no dangling links or malformed URLs in our application. And the way that you build this application is you can just write two different function definitions. The second one, which is where we started, uses the normal HTML A tag, but instead of an href with a string, it uses a, a, an alternate link attribute that contains an expression to evaluate when that link is clicked to generate the resulting page. And that just calls up to this target function, which is the second page that we visited. So I have a question, you know, sometimes, I don't know, so sometimes when you click on links, it doesn't go to a new page, it goes into the same page. That's a special kind of link? Uh, it goes to somewhere else on the same page. So you mean like oh, the sign on it? Right? Ah, OK, so that's a different kind of link then. You can define that also. Uh, so th there's this concept of anchors in HTML where you can have links inside a page. Uh, I haven't actually implemented that yet in this okay. in this okay. system. Okay. There's probably so, a current way of having it. In this server, we have this problem that like, we don't like we didn't have the like kind of non forgeable and like, all these correct links, but the problem is like there's how do you, like sometimes you want to have like nice names, right? For for your rails and Oh, I should probably not have hidden the location bar. Actually I need to let me bring this up in a separate browser window. So uh, 
you can see what it looks like if I unhide the browser bar. So, it, so everything's based around an ML style module system. So module paths are used as unique identifiers to pages, and that's what you see up here. Uh, demo is the enclosing module for the whole demo. Link is the, the source file that we were just looking at, and main is the name of a function within there. And you can have arbitrary nesting from submodules. Okay, so if you call it the procedure, like you might see something like that. So, so are you explaining that every the notion of a page being generated is also coupled with the identifier of the page? So you can once the page is generated, you can type that identifier in that box and go straight to that page. Is that what you mean? Yes. the The way the web server works is it it parses the the part of the the URL uh, and treats it as a module path inside your program and finds the right function that's named by that path and runs it. And you can, I'll, there'll be an example later about uh, what happens when you want more of that dynamic pages that take arguments. And those will just appear as extra parts of the URL. They'll sort of look like descending further into a file system tree. And they'll be parsed correctly as function arguments. So when you click on go there, does that change the target? Yes. Little things like pretty URLs are often underlooked in research projects, but I wanted to do that here. <laughs> yeah? How does, how does a function, how does the system decide to treat a function as a page rather than just as something that keeps some of the or something? It has a type. Let me show you the type of the this function. Uh, so I can go back to full screen mode. So the type, this is the signature of the application. It says that main is a function from no arguments to a transaction that produces a page. And these are the things that are treated as pages. So it's based on the return type? Like yes. Uh, and you can, if you have some things that are pages, but you, you don't want to advertise them as part of the interface, you can just leave them out of the signature. Uh, they'll, they'll still be accessible if they're called from other pages. Type of target here was also a uh, unit arrow transaction page. Yes. There'll be more complicated examples. Um, uh, three demos from here. <laughs> uh, okay. So we can write recursive loops between pages without much trouble. Uh, this is always fun. And uh, all this is is uh, two mutually recursive functions with sort of ML style syntax for the mutual recursion. Main calls, uh, yes? Question. But how did you know that you, there are only two pages? Why does it descend into generating more and more pages? Because a page is identified, so each page stands for a pointer to a particular location in the source code, namely one of these function definitions. And the source code is only finite, so you're not going to end up with. Oh, a page is not like a dynamic value? Uh, a page is a function in the source code plus arguments to it. In this case, there are no arguments, so there's just a finite set. The, I'll shortly have an example where there are arguments, so you can think of it as having infinitely many pages. And uh, that's one of the examples people like using the most to see how many, how far they can make it go. But it keeps going. <laughs> Knew the URL was demo hello slash target. Could we just go there? Would that work? Or that, yeah, that works fine. Uh, there are also you can make all sorts of decisions on how cl how much work you invest to keep the user from diverging from the the flow through the application that you could actually get from starting from the first page. Uh, a lot of those things I don't work too hard to to guarantee. There are just a, a few kinds of mistakes like that that are associated with common security vulnerabilities that there's special code to deal with. Like uh, there's something called cross-site request forgery where, say, you, you post on a forum a, a link to a well-known bank website that, that says something like, transfer all my money to this guy over here. And users to your 
users of the forum think it's a link to a funny picture of a kitten, you click on it and their money gets transferred. There's a, there's a use of cryptography and signing to prevent that particular kind of thing. But mostly, you, if you know the URL, you can, you, can, you can, if you know the URL, you can hit any page that has no side effects. And the compiler enforces that you really understand which pages don't have side effects. Um, all right, so here's a page that actually involves conceptually infinitely many pages. We can just keep stepping through, incrementing a counter. And uh, there's no server-side state that tracks what's, how far along the counter is. This is all stored in the client. And the way you can write this is as a function counter that takes one argument, n, which is the, where the counter stands. You can return a page that injects the current value of a counter and has two links, one to a recursive call where the counter is increased by one and one where the counter is decreased by one. And maybe it's useful to bring up, do this in a way where you can see what the URL is. Uh, all that's happening is that the argument of the function ends up automatically serialized and deserialized from the end of the URL. Question. It might be just obvious, but you, you're thinking of a collection of web pages as a reactive program, right? And which is expecting input from the from the user at whenever they click something, and as a result of that, the state of the program changes in the sense that its sort of program counter moves from one control location to another, and then again waits for an input, right? Is that how I should think of it? Uh, Yes, except there's this, this property that the user can always guess URLs and jump to a different part of the, the state graph if he's clever enough, but mostly that's how it will work. I see. I see. The continuations in this case are getting passed on the client. That's what's right. right. The state lives only on the client, and the client can lie about its state if, it, uh, if the user knows how to pick an, a URL that is, is actually valid for the application but is not where it should really be going next. I see. So, for example, like when you when the when say the focus of the user is on one page, that page has lots of crud in it, including some links. Now, the uh, the uh, the uh, the computational equivalent of clicking on a link means that the function corresponding to that page is going to be executed with a particular argument. Is that how you should think of it? Yes, that's it. Nice. Okay. Good. And here's an example of a more interactive page. This is a silly demo that just shows uh, echoing back what the user enters into a form. And it's pretty easy to write this in a way where we're sure that the form actually is matched properly with its handler typewise. Let's start by looking at the main function. It returns an HTML form that starts out looking pretty normal. There are two differences from the usual way of, of writing HTML or from actual HTML. This is sort of a stylized superset. Uh, each of the inputs, like this text box here, instead of having an attribute name equals whatever, has a, an escaped piece of ur syntax, which says the name of this widget is the field name A, and so on for the other widgets. And there's a submit button that uh, has a, a, an attribute that says the action for this button is the handler function. So when you click this button, run this function on the values of the widgets. And we can look at the handler function and see it takes a record r as an argument, and it can just project out the three widgets, the values of the three widgets that we used. And each one of these has the appropriate type. In particular, the two that came from text boxes are strings, and the one that came from a checkbox is a Boolean. And we can be sure that this, doesn't, this code doesn't erroneously try to use a field that we didn't define or doesn't try to use one of these fields at a different type than the widget actually produces. Is there any analysis on the strings that are going in the text boxes? Uh, no, any string is allowed. Okay, so are you going to show us what it looks like if not every string is allowed? Well, if not every string is allowed, then you just complain if you don't like the string that comes back. Okay. Oh. There, or you can have client-side code that watches the strings and complains in real time as you don't like them. But uh, the, what HTML gives you doesn't really provide a 
more general way of constraining strings. So I guess one thing I was wondering is if you had some, some way of constraining these strings. Well, it's, I can really only do what the browser lets me do, and I don't know another way to do it. So, so I guess to, to push on that a little bit, what if you if you went back to that form and for field day you supplied angle slash td close angle, right? Uh, what you were saying before was that handler will always return an XML that XML will be well formed, okay. um, but I can break that well formedness by inserting. A closed tag, basically. You, you could if this index here meant something other than what it actually means. But the disinsertion code uh, is abstraction preserving. Your, your string is not interpreted as HTML. It's, it shows up as a, okay, so a string. I think, that, I think that's the answer to the previous question. Is that okay. Any string is allowed, but it is escaped by your injection syntax. Okay. So, so what you're saying is that the problem of taking care of making sure that these strings are valid but pages are an orthogonal issue. It's not yes. your problem. Somebody else has to take care of that problem, either by dynamically checking or building some other static checking on the strings that come in, things like that. Is that yes. what you mean? Yeah. Although I think in practice, uh, what this means is your, your form receives a string and you just write a function that inspects the string and decides if you like it or not. It's not really a very complicated uh, procedure and at the same time it's hard to think of how to do better than that. So for example, like, you know, I, I mean, I'm not really, I don't really work in this area, but I keep hearing about people talking about all the SQL injection business. Yes. So what, so how does that fit into the story? Uh, so the, the previous question sort of is addressing that. Uh, someone was asking, if the user enters a, a string in one of these text boxes that has some HTML and then you go to display what he entered, does that get interpreted as HTML and maybe run some JavaScript code? And the answer is that uh, there, there's this, this quoting and anti-quoting syntax that always makes sure that uh, strings never get interpreted as code. I see. So, so your the OR solution is that you program in OR, and then you, whenever there's some interaction with the user in which you can provide strings, you write some uh, checking code that makes sure that the input is well formed, something like that. Uh, and actually, the type system enforces that you can never forget to do that properly. So I, I my understanding was that if the user entered, entered a uh, closed slash TD in the text box A, yeah. the uh, OR runtime takes care of, uh, when it constructs the, the, uh, the HTML page in response, the OR runtime takes care of escaping uh, the closed tag with an ampersand LT and so on, so that it's not actually interpreted as XML. Ah, okay, okay, very good. Is that right? Yes, thanks. So that, that kind of doesn't actually affect this, has not like that, maybe that gets a lot of um, kind of like for novice developers that actually does some kind of like the easy attack case and stuff like the MySpace attack. Because the problem is you actually had a parser with a mismatch where MySpace put in, they actually they tried to, this is the same we learned that, you know, you go to a web page, it, um, you load the virus in a, um, it'll have, yeah, as you will ask, will try to friend somebody else and then you'll inject uh, the, the virus onto your own web page. The next time somebody else goes to your, your, uh, your MySpace page, they will get the attack and it just keeps propagating through the network. So the problem there was actually it's, it's fine to put in on the server side this like encoding stuff. The problem is you have a parser mismatch where MySpace put in the encoding, but in reality they forgot to filter some stuff out. And uh, so then, based on like, the, you know, some fancy CSS encoding stuff that they still found a way through. So like, commercially people try to do this, but like that's not actually addressing the problem. I, I think that it doesn't address the problem if you want to allow users to provide their own content using as much of HTML as possible. But if you're willing to pretend it's 1995 in your validation, then it's pretty easy to rule out that kind of attack. And some people will be disappointed, but you will at least won't have any code injections. <laughs> And you can gradually add more and more of that as you convince yourself you wrote your parser correctly. Okay. Uh, all right. And then let me just show you briefly uh, what it looks like to interface with an SQL database. Here's a interface for manipulating an SQL table. We can add a row to our table and delete. That's all this demo has. And I don't want to look, oops, don't want to look in too much detail at the code, but I just want to point out, here's a piece of SQL syntax that's included inline in the code, and that's type checked and 
verified to match the actual schema of the table, which you actually define up here using a special declaration form, just like you were defining a function. And you give a record type that, that maps each one of the fields, or otherwise known as columns of your table, into their, their types. And the and you can write SQL inline for querying from the table. Here's some inline SQL for inserting into the table with some anti-quotes for injecting ur values into your, into your command. And here's some delete command just off the bottom there. And all of this is, is type checked to uh, match up with this schema. And when the application starts, it it reads the, the database's system catalog to check that the tables really have the types you said they would have. Dynamically type SQL interfaces could do this already. Like instead of, you don't get security conscious uh, developers, I mean, you know, best practice, not a best practice, is you don't do string concatenation. You just you know, print a question mark and later and then print. Like, sure, but that's, that's more, it's more work to separate out your, your queries that way. Like review as a uh, yeah, it just makes it cleaner to, you can write what you really meant and not what was convenient for the implementer of the database library. And writing a version with question marks and then the parameters is, to me, is less direct than, than this. So you can primarily view this as a syntactic uh, I guess that compared to anything with dynamic typing, you can be sure that you don't mismatch the types of the parameters to your prepared statement statically. Uh, yeah, that's this declaration. And you can declare module local tables inside, say, a functor output, and they have the same properties as an abstract type inside an ML module. Uh, the application is responsible for deciding what the database looks like, and the compiler outputs this SQL script you can run to make sure the database looks like that. So that means if you modify the database and then you recompile your program, you'll get a compile time error that hopes the database has modified your program. You'll get a startup time error. When the program starts, it, it, it queries the system catalog and checks that everything is as it expects. It's kind of with the way these things are usually implemented, it's hard to do that in the compiler because you'd have to somehow clamp down the database and prevent it from ever changing, which is, doesn't usually work. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could, I could, there could be an alternate version of the compiler that embeds the database and controls everything about it inside its own executable, and then there, things would be more direct in some sense. But probably harder to administer because you'd have to rewrite all these uh, high, avail high availability tools that the main database servers have. So you started by saying, uh, uh, talking about things like Ruby and Rails, and given a descriptor of a database will uh, you know, automatically generate yes. code that, uh, say, uh, provides you with ways to access this table and insert into it. So are you going to show us? Yes, that's, that's more or less the next thing. <laughs> I guess I have, theoretically, one minute or so to do that. <laughs> I guess if people wanted to leave, So here's my first example of, of the kind of metaprogramming that I think is the most ne neglected thing in other projects that try to use static types in this setting. This is a really simple form echoing application. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that it's implemented using a generic component so that the full implementation of this application is just this source file, which says, call this component. I'd like you to build me a form echoing application that uses these names. There's an underlying record field named A that should be printed with the label tick, and same for B, C, and tack and toe. And, yeah. So, so again, I want to just understand what you just said. So you're saying that this metaprogramming means that the program that is going to be executed is actually constructed initially by performing some computation. Yes. And then that constructed program executes. It's, this this metaform.make is sort of like a function that is going to build your application for you by analyzing this structure. And can you show me the constructed application? Uh, well, the code doesn't get output. It's all done internally inside the compiler, so it's not easy for me to, to show it to you. Uh, okay, okay. It looks a lot like the earlier manual echo example, if oh. you were to expand it. So can you just say in English what that thing will do? It's going to output 
an application that displays a form with one line for each of these record mappings, it uses these strings as the labels of the widgets, and when you click the submit button, it prints all the values you entered. No, I, I, no, I understand the oh. output. What I meant was that, how is this metaform.make saying? You want to know what algorithm it uses? or to Something like that, you know. Yeah. How does it construct the program? I was, I, I was going to flash up the, the, the source code at some point. Okay, okay. So, right. okay. Uh, question? Yeah, you say how this is more than just a malfunctor application. Yes. Uh, so here is the type signature of that component. So the first thing is this uses a richer type system than NL or Haskell supports. And I guess that answer is short, but it's sort of is that the whole answer. <laughs> it's just the details that matter. <laughs> so, so here is, let me explain what the arguments are. Uh, first, the interesting thing, two of these arguments weren't actually written explicitly in the application because they can be inferred from the others. So that's one extension over ML. Uh, in, it, functor arguments can be inferred in some cases, so that makes it easier to write shorter programs. But if we want to be completely explicit, what we're giving is a, is a, uh, a type variable, fs, of kind record of unit. Unit is like an ML, it's the, the kind that has just one value. So a record unit is essentially a set of names. So this parameter to the, to the uh, functor tells us which field names this application wants us to use. There's another value of type folder fs. Folder is a type that basically stands for permutations of the, a set of field names. They fix an order of these names so that if we would like to step through them in order, we can follow this, this instruction. So to implement this form that lists all these fields in order, we need to use this folder to step through them for each field printed out. Finally, there's a record that gives a string name to each one of these fields, and that's expressed in a, in a kind of unusual way. We would like to say somehow this is a record where it's, it's a regular ML record type, except every type has to be string. We can't make any other choices. And the way that that's expressed is by saying we start out with a record of unit values. In other words, a record with uh, information-free values for each of the fields. And we replace each of these placeholders with string by mapping over it. So we map over the, the record fs and we replace each of the values of each of the fields with string. And this way we say only string is allowed in our record. And it seems kind of uh, a weird way to do it, but I couldn't come up with a more direct way that, that wasn't uh, too specialized to this kind of example. So would it be correct to say that the generated program could have been written directly by the user at work? Yeah, it's, it's just like C++ templates. This is a time-saving mechanism that doesn't uh -huh. increase expressivity in the sense of computability or anything like that. And so this functor takes these things as input, and it outputs a main function for your application, which returns a page when called. Uh, looks like this. Uh, I don't want to explain all the details of this, but let me just point out the main action here is generating the form and generating its handler. In each case, we call library functions with names that begin with fold. These are different ways of stepping through all the fields in a, a record and modifying a functional accumulator as we do so. And they just need a few type arguments to be specified explicitly. Uh, the details of doing that are a little bit more intricate than, than ML and Haskell programmers are used to. But the final code, uh, once you have a little practice reading it, isn't, isn't all that, that dense. And the, the total length of the file is pretty short. And in the end, we get a very strong static guarantee that this dynamic process never outputs a, a mal malformed application which is, I think, a good, a reasonable price to pay for the extra type complexity. All right. So actually, I have another question. So when does meta programming, this is not related to web applications. Um, so why doesn't everybody always do meta programming? When does it make sense? Um, maybe a, a kind of uh, snarky answer is that most people don't use meta programming because they don't believe in static types, but static types are so useful for making sure you don't screw it up that they're kind of handicapping themselves. But <laughs> an autonomous issue from static types, right? Well, I mean, it's a way of basically generating programs, yes. writing programs 
programmatically, right? Oh, another answer. And you can do the same, right? You can generate jungles, all right? Huh? Another answer is that metaprogramming is already really popular in C++ templates and Rails scaffolding and all sorts of other systems. But these are relatively clunky, unprincipled interfaces compared to uh, ways of doing it like this that are more inspired by type theory uh, and coming up with a minimal set of constructs to get the job done while still giving you strong guarantees. So m maybe the question is, why don't more people uh, use better programming systems that are more principled and less just about... So, so in your mind, metaprogramming is very tightly coupled with static typing? No, I just think that static typing is so useful for, for metaprogramming that more fewer people would give up on trying to write metaprograms if they were using static types to help them catch the bugs in their code generators. Okay. All right, so I guess I was done describing this part. Here's an example of my version of the the most common Rails code generation, the generate, which is uh, called CRUD for create, read, update, and delete. This is the standard admin interface generator. Here's a table uh, we want to we want to add rows to it. Uh, see which rows are in there now. You might want to be able to change the value of one of our existing rows or delete a row. Uh, nothing very interesting there from a functionality standpoint. Uh, the interesting thing is that here's the file that implements this particular application. Let's define our table with its columns and their types. And uh, we call a, a functor. We tell it which table to build this, this application for. We give it a title to display in the, in the title bar. And we give it a record of metadata for each of our columns of the table that, that express things like how should we format this values of this column when we display them, how should we render the widgets that take in inputs for this column, and so on. And in each of these cases, I use one of the, some standard functions from the library for the, the default handling for a particular type. Yeah? Does that mean this is actually strong enough such that instead of just creating, filling out entries in the, in the, uh, in the table, you can actually create a UI where you can actually create new tables and create new type tables? So first, there are no dependent types here in the sense that there's a strict separation between runtime and compile time, and a uh, compile time thing never mentions a runtime thing. The feature that's here is an interesting idea of type level computation. And okay, uh, there's no support right now for creating tables dynamically. Tables are only defined at the top levels of modules. It would be possible to, to add a way of creating a local table, um, but I'm not sure how that interacts with the use of type level computation. You can do that in ML just as easily. You just wouldn't have as much information about the table type. Or am I missing some property? I want to create, I want to create a user interface for creating tables. I want to create a, oh. an administrator panel for creating tables. On yeah, I don't, th that would require actually using dependent types <laughs> to yeah, make it work. But, but like, you uh, luckily, that seems to be a relatively infrequent property of web applications that they want to do. So this is domain specific, and that's not part of the domain for now, I guess. Uh, that I'll just admit that that's outside the domain of this tool for now. Do you think inherently or not? Because to me, it sounds like you should be able to do it. Well, it's, it's easy to say. Uh, well, you can solve that problem if you just add dependent types, but it turns out to be more complicated than that in practice. <laughs> Strings are like both A. Um, can those be arbitrarily complicated expressions? Like, could I put an infinite loop in there? You mean this string constant? Yeah. Uh, this is just treated as a string. It's not interpreted. This is only for display purposes. You could, you mean, put an expression here that calls an infinite looping function? Yeah. That would work fine. It would be just like an ML. Your program would hang when you started it. <laughs> I'm just wondering, is that an infinite loop at compile time or runtime? Uh, that's an infinite loop at runtime. So, so you'd be able to visit other pages that didn't need to use that code, but when you got to there, it would run forever, I guess. Can you write <laughs> the recursive type level functions? No, no. Not. the only kind of recursion is this very simple map-based recursion that isn't even explicitly recursive. So it's, it's, it's important because when you're type checking, you have to run programs and you don't want it to go forever. <laughs> I, I just want to understand a little bit better your comment that 
So Leo mentioned some application, and then he said, okay, it uses dependent type, and he said, oh, I don't have dependent type, so I can't express it. Yes. So, why? I mean, you can, you can probably express it, but you cannot guarantee safety in the sense, right? You can write that down, no? Uh, I could add features that make it possible to do that kind of thing, mm -hmm. but the system as it is now guarantees that every table access is done properly. I could add another SQL interface that lets you access a table with fewer guarantees, and then that would be more easily compatible with what Leo asked about. But uh, so, I mean, in general, I, what I don't understand is that are you saying that your programs that I that you generate they can't crash? It's it's the usual well tied programs don't go wrong theorem extended to work across whole uh, client server interactions. More or less. Can I write an assertion in this program? Can I say assert x less than y? Uh, you can write an assertion. You, you, you can write code that fails if a particular Boolean expression turns out to be false. Right. But, and you will not be able to, I don't think your tag system will be able to make sure that that Boolean never is, right. is so false, right? This isn't about uh, making sure your application invariants are never uh, ignored. This is about making sure the program doesn't crash by Going by failing to follow the rules of some generic abstraction, like uh, you shouldn't be able to submit a form and have an input interpreted as an integer when it was really a string. So, so what I, okay, so, so now what I was wondering is that since you allow for that loophole where your 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 thing can crash if uh, if x is not less than y, why can't that same loophole be used to encode Leo's application? Uh, why do you need to enrich your language more? Well, for I guess I could add a library function that creates a table and does dynamic checking somehow in the, in the way you seem to be suggesting. Okay, uh, using the, some assertion or something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it, would, it would have to be in the runtime system. It, uh, it would have to be implemented outside the language. I don't see a point, though. I mean, what do you mean by program crash if that's less than y? Some, you know, it, it, it's not claiming that the program is correct. Uh, I mean, what I don't understand is that, I mean, unless, so, so either his language is Turing complete or it's not. If it is, then what Leo is asking for is a Turing computable function, right? And he should be able to do that. But it's, it doesn't, it's not quite that simple because this isn't just about computing arithmetic functions. This is about interfacing with particular systems like the database server. And there are strong guarantees about how that interaction can be done. Oh, I see. It's input output. So there are some input outputs that would be forbidden. It's Okay, okay, maybe. Okay. It's also not clear for the thing that I was asking, which is actually a very particular use case where I want to allow users to create tables. Like, I want them to create, like, maybe add a field to their um, form or something. Mm -hmm. so, and that's actually, because it's domain specific, I think, like, in this case, you might actually have a shot at being able to do that. That's why I was just kind of, I, I, I don't think actually it was to That's why I was kind of excited about the possibility of being able to check accesses over it. And, Uh, so let me just talk briefly about the, the interface of this component. I don't want to go into the details of this too much, but the interesting thing is here, here's where it's important to be able to write type level functions and map over them because I define what metadata is needed for each column as a function from a pair of types to a record type. The pair of types tells you the application's representation of this column and the database's representation of this column. One piece of metadata is a parse function that goes from the database's representation to the application's representation. There's a function for computing, changing the application rep into a piece of HTML. There's a function for building a form widget with, and uh, a few other pieces. And the type of the metadata needed for the whole usage of the functor is expressed as by taking a record of pairs of types standing for your whole set of columns and mapping this, mapping this metadata function over each of those pairs to form a record type with the dollar sign operator. Um, yeah. And there's a, in the functor signature, we see a, another non ML supported thing, which is a, a, a constraint, which is sort of like a precondition to using this functor, which is to call this functor, you must be able to prove that the column ID is not among the columns that you mentioned explicitly because we're going to use special handling for ID. And just one more thing, uh, this has all been sort of web, web 1.0 kind of stuff. I can also build a web 2.0 style, the same sort of thing. Here's a way 
of uh, viewing and updating a database where you can make changes that you batch locally before you tell the server anything and then execute them all in a bunch. Uh, at no point during this is the page refreshing. This is all using the usual client side AJAX stuff. And we can actually execute a batch of changes. We can click this update button to ask the server what the current table values are. And we can delete some of those and then update and check that it really happened and so forth. And this application is built by a functor application just like in the, in the previous case. It's really the same, the same thing from, from this level of detail. So you mentioned something in the beginning about this long holding uh, kind of uh, strategy to get data pushed from the uh, server to the client. I suppose could, could you use something like that here instead of I mean explicitly take the update to to get the, the, the changes to actually have the server push it? Yeah, I'm kind of, this is a good place to uh, demonstrate that. Uh, I also have a, a the last demo on this list is a chat application that, that uses long that uh, server to client flow to notify of new messages but uh, sure uh, might not be able to explain it within the amount of time available but uh, maybe I call it something different okay button value equals update on click equals call this function to get the list of rows. That function is automatically RPC'd to the server. And then set this, this uh, client side variable with that list. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll like that. All rows is a continuation. Uh, you RPC it, it's, this is implemented using continuation passing style. The programmer doesn't need to think about that. So that you give continuations on the client, which is kind of cool. Okay. And the, this setting influences what the page looks like because uh, it uses FRP to propagate things into the DOM. So that's a, so Alice is something you treat as a cell. LSS okay. is I'm, I'm always not sure what the usual standard terminology for FRP is. Here I'm calling it a source, and a page is a signal, which so is a pure function of this, sources. This isn't real. I would, it's not the FRP is right away. This. This is definitely a bank. It's like half. half. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess this is the natural ending point. I can, I don't know. I, I can keep showing people demos as long as we're allowed to keep in the room and people have questions. <laughs> it's probably a good time to sort of wrap up. Yeah. I'm, I'm wrapped up. <laughs>